The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for your flexibility. I know that we changed the time on you, and so for those that are able to join us live, we're so thankful that you're spending your time with us on this Wednesday. We know you have a lot going on. There's so many meetings and webinars and faculty meetings and Many of you are probably even teaching classes online, and so we're just glad that you're with us. We are so excited to have Dr. Lynn Swanner with us today. She is part of ACSI on their leadership team, the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer. So we're going to be um, casting vision about what the future of education could look like with her today. But before we do that, I do want to clear up some possible confusion. I know we've been creating a lot of content around COVID-19 and the CARES Act here at Vanderbilt Men for Christian Schools. And so um, this webinar, we are not going to be addressing any CARES Act questions, but we just got off of a Facebook Live with Senator Tim Scott, which is why we actually had to move the time of this webinar. So I put the links there in the chat box of your um, control panel. If you click on those links, specifically the one about the details of the CARES Act, you'll get to watch the Facebook Live that we just did with Senator Tim Scott. We got to address some additional questions. Sutton gave the updates of what has changed since our last Facebook Live on Monday. Things are changing by the minute um, for churches and Christian schools. So that is a really helpful up to the minute resource there for you. Again, it's there in the chat box. Um, we'd love for you to check that out if you have any questions about the CARES Act or um, the you know, Paycheck Protection Program. And then we've even gotten some questions from Christian schools about EIDL that Brian Jensen, our executive search consultant, has been able to weigh in on. So um, we'd be glad to help in any way we can after this webinar or on that page. But um, for the sake of this webinar, uh, I am Holly Tate, Vice President of Business Development at Vanderbilt Men. I've been on the team for almost eight years. And I love getting to spend my days helping Christian schools and churches and Christian nonprofits with staffing and succession planning. And I um, also want to introduce my colleague, Brian Jensen, who is our executive search consultant that is specializes in education. So he spends his days really um, praying for and visiting with and helping our Christian education clients. So Brian, if you'll introduce yourself um, would love for folks who are new to our webinar series to hear your story today. Absolutely. Uh, happy to be here today. And if you're joining us for the third week now, I'll keep this short so you don't hear my story for the third time in a <laughs> row. Uh, but I spent 15 years in Christian education. Uh, I served at two different colleges, uh, one North Central University in Minneapolis, Minnesota, is where I cut my teeth in student affairs. And then I spent 12 years at Geneva College in uh, just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, the last four years I spent there as the vice president of student development, overseeing program services, athletics. And so my, my bent is towards uh, student services <clears throat> and really enjoyed that work. And I've been with Vanderblumen now for over a year as we've uh, expanded into Christian education and nonprofits, which is where my background is. And I really enjoy my days talking with uh, schools and nonprofits as they navigate staffing challenges and uh, thinking about uh, how to best situate their school for the future and have really enjoyed, I've been on the phone a lot the last couple of weeks, just trying to encourage people, praying a lot with people as we're experiencing some, some challenges, but have really enjoyed being able to offer encouragement and, and uh, advice wherever I can. So thank you. Absolutely. We're so grateful for your wisdom and expertise. You've gotten to help so many of our Christian school clients and people that aren't even clients of ours, but are a part of our Vanderbilt Women community that read our blog or uh, attend our webinars. And so you've just been such an encouragement to those folks. And we're so grateful that you're on our team. We are also joined today and are so excited to have Dr. Lynn Swanner with us, who's the Chief Innovation Strategy and Innovation Officer at ACSI, Association of Christian Schools International. ACSI is also a client of ours at Vanderbilt. We are so honored to be able to help them find their VP of Publishing at ACSI and Brian um, is leading that search for our team at Vanderblumen. So Lynn, we know that you have a house full of children <laughs> and that you have a very busy schedule. We are so excited to have you with us. Um, would love to turn it over to you to share your story so that folks can hear a little bit about who you are and what you spend your day doing at ACSI. 
Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me today. And thanks for all Brian and Holly and your whole team there that you're doing for schools to support us during this time. And I know that everyone really appreciates it. And it's been great to see the body of Christ really coming together uh, during this particular challenge. So in my role, well, I'll start, Brian and I actually have a few things in common. I actually started out in higher education as well, started out in student affairs. And after I did my doctoral work, became a, a professor and an academic administrator in education. And so I was very happily ensconced in, in higher ed for quite a few years. And then my kids went to Christian school and I started volunteering at the Christian school and, and fell in love with it. And so made that transition into a K to 12 Christian education, which then led me into a career with ACSI. I've been at ACSI for about five years now. My current role, uh, I really love it because I get to combine working with school staff, with heads of schools, with, with teachers, um, with their administrators, and also my research background and my higher education background. So in my role, what I do is look at some of the biggest questions and challenges that we face in Christian education, and then develop strategies and ways to go about addressing them, re-navigate, reframe them as opportunities. So that involves things like dialogue, uh, working with experts and interdisciplinary teams and doing research and disseminating findings. So it's it's an exciting way that I get to combine kind of both of my worlds. Absolutely. Your role, ever, ever since I, I got to meet you in person for the first time um, last fall at, at the CISA um, symposium, and I saw your title and just thought, what an amazing role that you get to combine just your gift of how God has wired you to think about the future and have a vision for the future um, and all of your research and, and experience in education, it's awesome. And we're so grateful for the work that you're doing at ACSI to really pave the path for Christian educators and help us think about what things should look like and how we can improve. So I'd love to um, start out, Lynn, and just hear from you about, I mean, you are on the front lines. You are leading cohorts um, as a part of your role at ACSI, you're talking to Christian educators all over the country, and even ACSI has a global uh, reach. You have schools all over the world. So what have you learned about education and even what people are experiencing right now from an education standpoint during COVID-19? Yeah, I think like 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 both of you, I spent a lot of time on, my phone, on the phone, Zoom meetings and text messages with Christian schools uh, and with our colleagues. So I think there are, there are really two sort of large buckets in that that what we're learning falls into um and the first is and is really that this is an arc of experience and there's sort of this narrative this this journey that we walk through in dealing with crisis that everybody in our schools are going through and i think the sooner we recognize that the sooner we can successfully navigate it and i'll explain what i mean so very early on my husband and i looked at each other we have three kids school age kids and we said we'd better sit down and watch cast away with these kids <laughs> maybe as a way to give them some skills um they're going to need over the next few weeks uh, so we didn't watch contagion we watched cast away um, Good call. Watch um but you know sort of you start out with this okay i survived the initial event and now I'm sort of just trying to survive and trying to hang on and you see him sort of flailing about and hurting himself and and then eventually you get to this sort of you know I made fire moment and um and so I think that's you know we go through these stages I mean most folks are familiar with Elizabeth Kubler Ross's work you know these stages of grief denial anger bargaining depression acceptance and uh I think People are at different places with that. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that even with this webinar, you know, I have colleagues who um, are just at a different stage. Uh, they're really grieving. And this, this conversation will be really overwhelming at this point. Now in a week or two, maybe not. Um, and then I have colleagues and friends who just the minute this happened said, okay, how are we gonna learn from this? So, and I think to not be judgmental about that, but to acknowledge that there's this diversity of experience um, and our school leaders in particular are grief counselors in a lot of ways right now. And, um, you know, Rex Miller, I was on a call with him, a mindship call the other night, and he said um, what he's doing right now is really trying to help his clients walk through those stages as quickly, but as safely and as lovingly as possible to where we kind of accept you know, we practice this radical acceptance and say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, what would it look like if I accepted that the world has changed and that there are going to be things that come out of this where it's going to look different. Not all of it's going to look different, but a lot of important things are going to look different. And I think once we can accept that reality, that's 
that's the way that we can move forward to really do some positive things and take some positive steps. And, um, you know, I think of that book, you may have heard of it. It's uh, Robert Evans, The Human Side of School Change. And you know, he really talks about how it, it changes loss and changes grief. And and I think what's different now is it's unavoidable. Everybody senses that they're they're changed. So the last thing I'd say about that is it's really helpful to ask people during this stage what we're learning is um, to ask what are we mourning, you know, what are we missing? Um, if we're missing people, if we're missing relationships, um, that's okay. If we are missing our routines and our institutions and kind of the way we always done things, um, that that gives us a moment to pause and reflect. And so what hasn't changed, no matter what your school looks like today, what hasn't changed is your mission. And so this is actually a really good time when your schedule is, is disrupted to, to try and fall back in love with that mission. Um, and what so what are we in love with um, and calling us back towards the mission? Um, and I think the second bucket of things that we're learning right now, and I'm really excited about this, is the value proposition of Christian education. You know, we can be nimble when we need to be. Education is not generally a nimble field. There's a lot of reasons for that. But we've seen that private schools aren't bound by as many restrictions as the public school sector. And so we can respond much more quickly. Uh, so I think that's part of the value proposition. Um, we also attend to the spiritual deeper questions in life, those kind of existential questions that come up during times of crisis. Uh, we can love and care uh, well. Generally speaking, we have these smaller communities that can take care of one another. Um, and so I think our value proposition is becoming really crystal clear. But uh, the last thing I'll say about that is we, it's not just enough for the value prop to become clear. We need to clearly articulate it. And so we have to articulate it daily to our students, to our families. Um, we have to show them how they're a part of that. And we have to communicate it externally. You know, I live in Pennsylvania and there have been a number of schools that have had calls from families that have their kids in different schools. And they said, you know, our kids' educational needs are not being met. We want to transfer right now. And so wow. what we're doing, yeah, it's happening. And so what, what we're doing in many of our schools is very attractive and that is the um, value proposition. Um, you know, there's this great new book by Matthew Loon, it's called The Best Story Wins. And so it's mm. like, what is the story your school is telling? And you know, this goes for marking enrollment and there's been a lot of great webinars on marking enrollment, but I think it's even something deeper when we think about that scripture in Second Corinthians, you know, that we should show we're a letter from Christ, not written with ink, but with the spirit of God on human hearts. And I remember hearing once a pastor say, um, if you're going to be a letter from God to the world, make it a good one. And so if you think of your school as a story from Christ, make it a good story and articulate it. So I think those are the two lessons, the two buckets of lessons that we have right now. Such good wisdom, Lynn, and I so appreciate your emotional intelligence to really bring up the fact that it's important that we as individuals recognize where we are in that grief cycle, because everybody is wired differently, and we're all in different stages. And I know even for myself, I was um, texting with somebody earlier today, I said, is it okay that I feel all three of these stages sometimes throughout the day? Like, sometimes I'm in stage five, and then an hour later, I'm in three, and like, because of, of just the weirdness that we're in right now. And so I so appreciate you bringing that up, that no matter where we are, whoever is on this call, no matter where we are, we just to acknowledge that it is okay where we are and to ask ourselves those questions that you said. And I'll just repeat them in case anybody was late to the call because I thought it was so good. It was, you know, if we're grieving the loss of relationships or connections with our team or, um, you know, the connection to some of the work that we were doing, that's, that is okay, but it's when we're grieving the way things always were or routines that we need to take time to reflect on that and figure out the why behind that. I thought that was a so wise, Lynn. Brian, you've also been talking to a lot of Christian leaders. What would you add or um, say to anything that Lynn just shared with us? Yeah, just very shortly, I, I, I keep reflecting on one of the, the very first vice president I ever worked for, um, had a saying he said uh, blessed are the flexible for they shall not break <laughs> and and i i've thought of that a lot the last few weeks because what i see us learning is or or maybe what i want to suggest is that we we don't say okay we started this we learned some stuff now let's change but 
we need to keep learning and keep pivoting almost on a daily basis right now. Um, you know, when we when we started this whole thing, just reflecting my own family, at first it was, well, school is out a week. Then it was, well, we're going to be out till the end of March. Then it was, I don't know what it is now, early May. And so you have to keep adjusting and keep pivoting. And, and in your own family, I know many are doing that, but also as school leaders, how do we keep adjusting? How do we keep saying we need to keep um, being flexible enough to respond to what's happening in real time and keep caring for our families and our students as best we can with the reality that we have and the reality keeps changing. Um, I keep telling school, schools that I'm on the phone with, uh, basically just to echo Lynn's comments, this is our moment to really shine uh, as, as small communities, as Christian schools that have amazing academic components and an incredible support structure for their families and their students and be the light one of Christ. Uh, and I've said this on webinars before uh, in, in the past couple of weeks, but I'll say it again because I think it's important. Be the light of Christ and his witnesses right now. And then be, be your school's witness so that, like Lynn said, there's families that are watching and saying, wow, look at that. Either I want to transfer right now or I'm definitely going to be looking as things as the dust settles. I'm going to be thinking about that in, for the fall. And so it's really a moment to shine. Absolutely. Um, so before we transition to our second question, I want to encourage everybody who's on this webinar with us today. would love for you to ask your questions to Lynn. So you have her here for 45 more minutes with us and would love to have her be able to speak into anything that you're thinking about or struggling with. I think sometimes it's easy for us to feel isolated or um, even be embarrassed about the ways that we're feeling. But uh, one of the things that I've seen over and over again every single day during COVID-19 is just the community and support that has come out during this time. It's always been there, but I think people are taking advantage of it a little bit more, which we're, we're really encouraged by. So if you have a question for Lynn, there's a question box in your control panel. Would love for you to put your question there. I've already been talking to a few of you that are joining us from all over the country. We're so glad that you're here. So put your questions there. We've got time for Q&A at the end. But Lynn, what um, the word shift, I know, is is one of your favorite words. <laughs> you write on mind shift and um, encouraging folks to think about shifting in education. So what significant shifts are you seeing happen in real time as all of this has unfolded? Yeah, it's interesting. So the, the mind shift book came out in right around September 1st of last year, which honestly seems like it was years ago. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And so, you know, a few of us who've been authors, you know, had the opportunity to present at, at different conferences and different speak at different venues. And so um, we actually we actually had a, one of the authors spoke at an event uh, out in California back in the fall and had a few participants who basically said, we, we really don't understand why this is important, what you're saying here. It's interesting, but we don't get it. Well, sure enough, he got an email this past week saying, now I get it. <laughs> Now I understand uh, <laughs> why you were talking about the need for these these changes and these these shifts. And so, in a really bizarre way, the book has actually has the sense almost of being prophetic, um, which is not owing to anything special about the book. I think it was just a moment in time where God really brought a few people together to ask these questions. Did not really have a lot of answers, but they turn out to be a lot of the questions we're asking today. So, if I just think about um, even the chapters in the in the book and and what the shifts are, um, I think there are lessons that we can take away right now and things that we can see going on. So, um, you know, if we think about machine to human, a, a lot of what we had pre COVID nineteen uh, in education, I'm speaking writ large, it's not just Christian schools, uh, wasn't really geared towards the way that students learn. It's you know a lot of education is fairly mechanistic. It's content focused. You know, we have students regurgitate. That's how we know if they've learned. And it's not um, always geared towards helping students become creators and collaborators, which is how God made us to be. So um, I think the lesson for right now is let's not just pour, is the word we used to use um, back when I was in college and studying some of this was kludge. Let's not kludge or pour what we do um, in, in the brick and mortar setting directly into our online platforms having a new platform enables us to think through deeply how we do school in general and how we help students to be more creative, to be better prepared, you know, Ephesians 2.10, to walk out in the good works that, that God has prepared for them beforehand. 
Um, and so I think that's a conversation we need to be having because um, online, I, I was talking to a, a high school principal just today who called me for some, some advice and I said, um, I, I would really suggest that uh, teachers flip their classrooms. If they're using any time on uh, the video to uh, give lectures, it's really an efficient use of time and you're wasting time, valuable time for building community and collaboration. So I think those are the kinds of things that people are rethinking is what it actually means for students to learn. And also for the first time our, in a long time, our teachers, every single one of them are learners themselves. And so it's this huge empathy building experience. You know, for my kids, we, we had a couple of teachers who had Zoom issues and missed their own classes. You know, it's, it's an empathy building experience when you're, you know, the dog ate my homework. It's like my computer ate my, my lesson plan. You know, so it's just this empathy building experience. I think there's that. Um, one of the things that I think is a huge elephant in the room, uh, and it goes along with our white to mosaic chapter, is this, this crisis is absolutely 100% a test for access and inclusion in education. Um, who has access to schools? That's a huge question. Um, and the current moment opens up all kinds of access opportunities where we can potentially serve more students and more families. Uh, at the same time, it opens up a lot of challenges for underserved students. Uh, you know, how do students from all backgrounds and abilities feel and really be full participants and, and members of our communities. And, and we know that crises like this disproportionately affect different communities. You know, one of the things that kind of drives me a little nutty on Facebook is people are like, yeah, it's day six of our coronation. You know, it's like, it's not a coronation. Uh, there are, you know, and I know they're, they're being, trying to make light of the situation, but you know, we think about essential workers, single parent homes, you know, lower socioeconomic status, do, do all families have access to technology? What if parents can't stay home with their kids? And so I think this is an opportunity for us to rethink how, what access looks like um, for our communities and, and really who we serve. Um, you know, isolated to network, one of the chapters, um, I actually recorded a podcast the other day with a head of school who successfully led a very large merger of two Christian schools. And he said, the landscape of education is screaming for collaboration. And this is a moment for collaboration. Almost every school that I've encountered is essentially rebuilding the wheel on their own. And heads of school are connecting, which is great, but are your teachers connecting? Can you, can you call up the school down the road and, and connect for ideas and so teachers don't feel so isolated? Um, and, and then the last thing I'd say is just obviously Gutenberg to 5G. I mean, come on. <laughs> You know, I mean, all of our excuses as Luddites are just taken away. And I think that fear factor, you know, is is just is is gone. You know, you've done it. You you can't say you might not like it, but you can't um you can't argue anymore. And and I and I literally, you know, that's not doable. Uh, you know, I remember literally having conversations when the book came out with heads of school who would say things like we or in teachers, we will never use technology, we will never go on. <laughs> And it's like, well, can't say that anymore. Some of them are killing it. Like they're they're out there crushing it. But this is sort of what took them to go over the hump. And so I think that when that fear of unknown is gone, um, it creates all possibilities for for asking those questions. And that fear of the unknown, I think, is a lot of the battle in our lives towards change. Um, so I know it's a it's a scary time for a lot of folks. Um, and some schools and leaders might feel that they've been, you know, obviously thrown into the deep end with regard to these various mind shifts. But I think in total, when you look at all these mind shifts um, and these shifts and just the way that we have to think and be and do and act, you know, I really think it's, it's forcing us to build the resilience that we need for the changes we've already been encountered and also for the changes that are coming. This will prepare us. We've been saying we need to do these kinds of things for a while and be more nimble. Um, and I think this will prepare us for what's coming. That's so good, Lynn. Uh, Kimberly just said, I love the idea of collaboration rather than competition. The church is one body, many parts. We must work together. That's so, so good. So that really resonates with um, those that are on the webinar today that really feel that, um, and your point about, we had Jay Ferguson on, who's actually the president of the ACSI board and the head of school at Grace Community School in Tyler, Texas. We had him on last week. And um, one of the things that he said that I loved, um, which affirms what you're saying is, 
that it's not even just an age thing. He said he's got, you know, baby boomer teachers that are crushing it with technology and he's got younger teachers who feel stuck. And so it's, it's not even just about age. It's such a mindset of thinking creatively and adopting um, new ways of doing things. So do you have anything to add to that where um, what you're seeing in the landscape of, you know, um, this, this forced, <laughs> forced to adapt of bridging the gap of generations or um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that since you're on the front lines. Yeah, so I think, you know, one of my, I love Peter Senge's work, you know, when he talks about uh, the, the fifth discipline, and, and there's a great book about what works in schools um, that applies that principle. There's a lot of authors that, that work on it. But the, the, basic, the basic underlying premise is that for schools to, to change and for schools to be successful, they have to a, a, adapt a learning orientation. And so schools are sites of learning, but like nine times out of 10, or maybe 99 times out of 100, when we think about that, we're thinking about student learning. We're not thinking about schools as a learning community, or uh, Wenger talks about a community of practice where we're all getting better and we're all relying on one another and collaborating. And I think for the first time in maybe a really long time, certainly in my memory in being in education, the whole educational sector has been thrown into learning mode. And, and I think that is what you're seeing a reaction to is people's proclivity to be able to learn on the fly, um, to be able to reflect, to be able to take feedback. And, and that is not uh, linked to technological adroitness and it's not linked necessarily to age, um, although certainly those could be factors for people both ways. It really is our ability to have that learning orientation. And that's the same for, for school boards, for heads of school, um, for teachers, for families. I mean, families are learning a ton of stuff right now. And, um, and as long as we can sort of stay, you know, we, we use the lip service a lot of lifelong learning, but, but this, this, is what, this is what we're in right now. So I see a lot of promise, um, you know, when, when we get sort of shocked out of our comfort zone it's the ability to learn and to reflect and, and to think and to collaborate that will will move us forward so i think that's what we're seeing um delightfully so because it removes mm -hmm. our it removes our excuses right we can't say oh this is a generational thing or this is a tech it's really no this is a learning thing this is about us learning as as practitioners Absolutely. Brian, anything you would add to the shifts that you're seeing boards or Christian school leadership have to make right now? Yeah, uh, well, uh, I made a note and then Lynn stole it before I got a chance to say it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would I would say finding your peer groups is one thing I see, I see and is just so helpful knowing that people are in this together. Um, I think one of the, the other things I'm seeing, which is, is really fun to see is, and Lynn was just hitting on this um, in her last thought, but the awareness of our response right now and the feedback loop in real time is one, happening uh, expeditiously and, and faster than we typically do in education. Having chaired the assessment committee once at my institution, we you know come up with things and we'd say, yeah, let's assess it. And then in like three years, we'll talk about it. Um, or accreditation, which happens every 10 years, if that gives you any indication of how much we were paying attention to assessment at the time. But I think I'm seeing schools right now do, I know I've talked to schools who are doing weekly surveys to their families, um, weekly touch points through survey um, feedbacks with their teachers, with their students, uh, and they're using that in real time. And I think that, that that's amazing. And we need, to, we need to not just say we do that in times of crisis, but how do we up our game in assessment and survey practices on a regular basis? Because you know, Lord willing, we won't face another COVID experience like this anytime soon, but what other crises do we need to be prepared for? How can we learn from this in real time and be using those practices to keep making ourselves better and improving our quality and our excellence as we move forward when we go back to quote, normal times in education. So, and I just, I think you're also gonna be seeing, and, you, and I've seen, um, I've talked to schools who are seeing this, you're watching in real time your superstars rise to the top. Um, as, as schools have had to pivot and as Lynn said, become learning communities together, 
you are watching who who your teachers are, who your administrators are that are taking the the proverbial bull by the horns and saying, all right, let's we have to do this. We don't have a choice. We can't sit back and just binge Netflix. Let's do this right now. And you're watching those um, those people rise to the top and pay attention to that. If you're ahead, if you're in, in uh, senior leadership, pay attention to who's rising to the top uh, because it's pretty clear right now. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Um, just a, a reminder, I've already got a couple of really great questions coming in. If you have a question for Lynn, uh, would love for you to put that in the question box there. We're gonna be opening up to Q&A in just a few minutes. So Lynn, recognizing that we've got a couple different well, across the spectrum of folks on the on the call, but some people who are forward thinkers and feel like they were built for this moment where they can just lead at the helm and, and bring everybody along and are very future focused. But then we've got others who feel stuck and are don't know what to do as far as how to think past today. And so I would love to hear from you, especially for those that that might feel stuck in the here and now what can they do practically to be thinking innovatively right now to prepare their school for the future? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and um, again, back to your original point or that you made earlier, sometimes you're all three at the same time, <laughs> yes. you know, all these different things. Like sometimes you can be that one of those two people within the space of a few hours. So I think it definitely, all, all of us have those, those moments. And so I wouldn't want anyone to think that they're, you know, entrenched or stuck just that this is something we're all processing through. Um, you know, I think about, you know, our friend, Bill Latham, he's worked with Rex on all his mindship projects. He's from Meteor Education. And he says, innovation comes from pain. And so I think acknowledging and recognizing, like we talked about before, where the, where the pain is from. And, and the key in that is to go from triaging the pain into learning and growth mode. And so it really is this intentional shift from I'm, I'm going to sit here and, and be stuck with with this this pain. I'm going to triage pain to and you, and you even see this in our in our uh, frankly, in our country's response to COVID-19. You know, it's sort of we're in triage mode to now, OK, how are we going to actually move forward um, in a productive way? Because we know there's going to be subsequent waves. So I think, um, you know, it's OK for us to have just been trying to survive for a few weeks. I think that's normal and natural. Um, but then we need to really start thinking about how do we start moving ourselves and our staff beyond that, like your like your question. Um, you know, Will Richardson from Modern Learners tweeted something out really interesting the other day. He said, um, we can do as many design sprints as, as we want, but at this moment teaches us anything changes a marathon. And so oh, I think- that is so good. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so we can do as many just design sprints as we want, but at this moment, teach us anything, change is a marathon. And, and then he, he finishes that quote by saying, the only way to train for it is to start with learning. And so um, I think we're exhausted from sprinting. You know, it's one design sprint to the next. So I think it's that mind shift to we're in a marathon and we need to start learning uh, and learning well. So actually, um, I wrote a blog post with the other two editors of the Mind Shift book with Eric Elfson uh, and Dan Barron, who are both with Case. And it was called um, disruption, disorientation, disorientation, and disequilibrium. Now what? Um, so, and and we talked about in there how you transition to that learning mode. And and a lot of the research on adult learning says you're you're not going to transition to learning without reflection. So, what we would really encourage is build in time for reflection, build in time for questioning. You can't necessarily take yourself out for coffee, but maybe you can get a cup of coffee and go hide somewhere in another corner of your house you're not usually in. Um, but the blog post actually has some, I think, some really good reflection questions in there, um, you know, around new mindsets and skills we're developing. What are we learning about student learning itself? How are we nurturing and building community? The value proposition, as I mentioned, what are efficiencies we're coming up with in school management, and then a lot of sort of prompts to help walk through those stages of loss and grief and change. And I've already heard from quite a few heads of school who have said, I'm, I'm going through this with my staff. We're going to schedule some time and we're going to walk through this together because they've been in these exhausting design sprints, as Will says. And these reflective questions are really what's going to help them sort of stop, pause, and think through what are we learning? What do we want to keep? What would we change? What are we missing? 
what are the new skills and mindsets that we're uh, developing and, and how does that actually inform and better position us for the future regardless of whatever that looks like and I, and I don't think anyone is um, and I think this is really clear to, to, to this is important to make clear no one is saying um, all right that's it that's the end of brick and mortar schools I mean that's not you know we're not prognosticating we're not predicting but to think that in some way that the cat is not out of the bag and we're going to stuff it back in the bag in terms of nimbleness and teacher learning and students be exposed to online learning and um, having independence, et cetera, to think we're going to completely stuff that back into the bag is, is just not realistic. Um, and so the key is how do we learn from what we're going through right now and build on that to actually have more of a gospel reach. You know, how do we, the key mindset question is, how do you take a challenge and translate it into an opportunity? And, and this is really the moment to be thinking along those lines. That's excellent. And I put the link to that blog article in the chat feature there on ACSI's website. So make sure you check that out um, in your chat feature there so you can grab that link and maybe even go through it as a board or as a leadership team. That's a, a wonderful word of advice there, Lynn, to, to work through that together. Brian, anything you would add to that? I think just uh, I'm thinking very, very pragmatically right now. Um, and I, I was thinking back to for, for a number of years that when I worked at Geneva, I chaired the, um, the crisis response team. And uh, so we would do tabletop exercises, right? So we'd, we'd uh, gather as a team and we'd think through what are we going to do if uh, a fire burns down a, a residence hall? Or what are we going to do if we lose power for a week? We never did a pandemic uh, you know, exercise. And so I think one of the things is take advantage right now of practicing what in real time, what you're having to do to, to navigate a pandemic. Again, we pray that something like this never happens before, but I would really sit down when the time is right and write down everything you're learning because you're learning things every day that you don't want to forget. And so if you're a senior leader, be jotting those notes down, um, have a team meeting, pull the right people together and create a contingency plan uh, that if we ever had to go to distance learning again on a moment's notice, how would we do it better than we did now? And, and many of you are doing it in amazing ways and I give you props for that, but how can we do it better the next time um, so that we're better prepared for it if, if something like that ever happens or, or some sort of natural disaster happened and we had to go to some sort of distance learning model uh, in, a, in a short order. Um, so just very pragmatically put together a plan that you can learn from. And then I would, uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago with Katie Weens on the line, but um, I would have a, when the timing's right, pull the right people together and have a real conversation with everything on the table about, you know, Lynn mentioned this, right? what's your ROI, ROI on your mission? So what, let's have a real conversation about our mission specific to our school um what's on the table that we're not ever going to take off i've been talking a lot with schools about what levers you're willing to pull right now and what levers you will never pull no matter what um till the till the doors are shut um because it's part of it's integral to our mission and we will never forsake our mission in these these areas i would put everything on the table and have those conversations right now and then how are you going to describe your value proposition in even better more accurate ways to the mission that you have um, because and, and then what sort of innovative ideas are going to come into play to help us accomplish mission uh, everything's on mission and so how are we going to think through those things in uh, in a time that we're just really forced to have those hard conversations um, you know be thinking uh, really intentionally about things that you've never had to really think intentionally about before that's good. And Lynn, one of the things that you said that brought up a, a thought for me was about no one is saying this is the end of brick and mortar schools. Um, but what are we learning through this time, to your point, Brian, that we can apply once we are able to be brick and mortar again? And one of those things that we've seen um, some clients go, oh, this has been revolutionary for us was maybe we don't all have to meet in person for every board meeting. You know, maybe board meetings will now be uh, via Zoom or video conference so that it can speed up decision-making processes for boards or committees who are making decisions and mostly would say, oh, that's got to wait until next month's meeting because until we're in person again, 
maybe that's, you know, using more technology to facilitate some of those experiences, um, you know, that this time can bring to force people to experiment with technology that they wouldn't before. So I love um, your point there that while, you know, nothing's going to ever probably go back to what it was before, it's going to be a look different, still probably, you know, brick and mortar, but what are some things we can take with us as we move forward? So Lynn, before we open it up to Q&A, we'd just love to hear from you. What specific encouragements are you sharing with school leaders um, through all of this? I know you're facilitating daily <laughs> calls. Um, so we'd just love to hear your words of encouragement and inspiration for school leaders. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of good, you know, webinars and resources out there uh, with, with regard to best practices and online schooling. I would think make sure you're reading those and accessing those because, um, I, you know, I've seen this kind of trend, you know, um, just because you took your school online doesn't mean all of a sudden you're doing online instruction. It's really crisis schooling um, until there's a lot of really good thought about pedagogy and, and how we understand student learning. Um, so, so you, you know, you want to keep moving forward for sure and keep the plate spinning, but you also want to um, ask some deeper questions about what, what teaching and learning really looks like at this moment and what are some of the best practices. Um, I think ask those reflection questions uh, because it really is, is you gotta create that space for reflection or you it just won't just won't happen. Um, really critically, I think is to take care of yourself and your well-being. You know, Rex Miller talks about this as the caregiver's dilemma, which is very common in education. This is not new. This is not just thanks to COVID-19. Um, you know, but how do we care for others? when we're worn out and um, everybody's tired, everybody's really tired. And, and um, you all in the podcast that we, we did before on some of the flourishing schools research we did, that research was done you know, almost a year ago and, and school leaders were already saying writ large that they were overwhelmed. And that was before COVID-19. So, um, and the same was true for teachers. So I think prioritizing well-being during this time, we actually have a blog post coming out next week specifically on that. Um, how do you take care of yourself? And that's gonna look different for every person. So I'm, I wouldn't be prescriptive on that, but prioritizing your well-being so that you're able to care well for the teachers and for your family and for others that are in your sphere. And then, like I mentioned this before, I've, I've really been trying to encourage schools to not go it alone, to get connected, get outside of yourself and your school, stop reinventing the wheel, teacher by teacher, class by class. That is just an absolute recipe for exhaustion. Um, connect with other leaders, connect your teachers with other teachers, buddy up with a school. I mean, it really, this, this moment is screaming for collaboration. And leaning on one another, you know, I think that's scriptural. I think it's biblical. I think it's, um, and I think it's it's wise. You know, as we lean on one another consistently, that will help with the marathon versus sprint aspect of this. So those are some of the pieces of advice, of advice that I typically give, in addition to all the practical pieces uh, that that uh, Katie and Jay did a great job of of talking through. You know, single source of truth, communicate often with the same message. You know, all those practical pieces. These are kind of the, the larger meta things that I talk about with leaders to make sure they're taking care of themselves and their team and really positioning themselves to learn from this moment. Absolutely. Well, let's jump into some, on that note, let's jump into some Q&A. Um, so if you have a question for Lynn, please type that there in the question box. I would love to get to as many as we can today. So uh, Lynn, Jonathan is asking, um, how would you prepare for next school year? So as we're thinking ahead to August and September, we obviously have no idea what that's going to look like right now. Um, but what would what should top priorities be for school leaders? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jonathan. I think that's that's first and foremost on a lot of people's minds is finishing this year as well as you can and then looking to the future. You know, a lot of the conversation um, is is around contingency planning. Uh, you know, particularly with uh, finance and marketing and enrollment, there's some really great resources out there, you know, webinars that have been been held to help you think through some of that. Um, and so I think the the financial piece is certainly something that you do want to think about. But I would I would encourage you, which is kind of the theme of this particular podcast, to not look at it as a disaster kind of cutting situation, but more, what are we learning about being nimble now? And could we introduce 
some innovative programs or, or just things that we could package, new things that we can do. Um, one school I know, this is really a great idea, um, they usually, they have to do online AP prep with their students. So what they're doing right now is they just open it up to the community. And so there are kids in public high schools that uh, need AP review. Uh, they want to take the exam and maybe their school's not even meeting, nothing's going on. And so that's a great way to, that, that's a way of taking a challenge and reframing it as an opportunity. So I that's would just- fantastic. Encourage, yeah, as you do that really good work of planning that you also think about where are the opportunities that we have here. With finances also, anything that you have going on regularly, like curricular review, anything that's going on instructionally, community-wise to really ask the question, what lessons can we take from this and how can we apply it? Absolutely. Brian, anything you would add to that as far as top priorities for August and September? Um, I think you need to, you know, we've been talking a lot about some of the stages we've been moving through. And, and yes, the last couple of weeks have been crisis response, damage control. As schools start to find a little bit more groove, hopefully, uh, that's what we're praying for you, is find, finding that groove or the next, hopefully, week or two and saying, okay, we, we, we feel like we've got our, our, our sea legs under us a little bit. Let's do some of our normal practices for planning. We need to do, um, you know, class scheduling for the fall. Do those things so that you're not behind the eight ball when you um, uh, start to think about it, you know, months down the road and you feel like, oh, I, I haven't done this in time. So do some of your normal practices and don't feel badly about that. Make sure you're sticking to some of your normal practices. I also would just point to, before we started the webinar officially, uh, Lynn and I were talking about some of her friends. I was part of a webinar yesterday, um, or I, I observed a webinar yesterday from Charter Oak Research guys, and they were, it was this uh, in partnership with the Center for the Advancement of Christian Education, they were talking about marketing and and um, enrollment, and how to uh, think about our funnel and prospective families for the fall, even now in the midst of crisis. And I would encourage you to to go back and view that that webinar because I I found it helpful, and I think it would be helpful for school leaders who are thinking about the fall right now. That's great. I love this next question from Kimberly. Are you seeing any specific trends or shifts in serving students with special needs, both at the preschool and middle school, high school age ranges? So Lynn, we'd love to hear from you on that. Yeah, it's a really good question, Kimberly. And actually we've been in the middle of a, a multi-year research project with regards to how Christian schools serve students with disabilities and so and with special needs. And so um, that's been a, a, an interesting experience of itself. What we found through that research, what I think is 100% applicable right now, is that most Christian schools are all over the gamut with this. Um, and so, you know, no two schools are alike. Um, you know, the, tr the trend that I would say, which I'm sure that you've seen, is that the number of students who have um, special needs and art and learning needs is, is increasing. It's just sort of the average family now, uh, odds are if it's got multiple kids in the family that there will be some type of need. So um, we are in the middle of a larger trend that's going on. Um, I would point you to uh, All Belong is a great organization. They are out of uh, Michigan and it's, it's allbelong.org. Um, they're formerly the CLC network, and they have been putting out some really good resources for how to uh, include students with disabilities in your planning and make sure that they're getting what they need and the support that they need through this time. Um, so I would, I would refer you to that. We also will have a blog post coming out in about two or three weeks on the same topic. I, I think that's one of the, the um, elephants in the room as well, uh, is that we need to be talking about that. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, but I am not, I'm seeing that schools want to serve them well, um, but that that is difficult even in non-COVID-19 times. So it is a concern of mine and, and, I, and I know there'll be some good resources coming out for that from all along. That's great. Brian, Jonathan is asking for clarity. Can you, and I'm going to try to type it as you're saying, where can they find that webinar that you mentioned? It's the Center for... Yeah, the Center Center for the Advancement of Christian Education was the host, and um, they should have it on their website uh, soon. Okay. It's not I'm up there know. right now. I just looked, but it should be soon. Yeah. And then Lynn, um, one of the things that we've talked about today is the fact that community is so important. Um, so can you share, I know ACSI does a lot of community building among school leaders. 
Can you share with folks who might feel isolated or like they want community right now, how they can get involved through ACSI with their peers? Sure, yeah. So you can actually, if you go to acsi.org, there's a whole coronavirus resource page there. You know, speaking about webinars, uh, we've been we've been doing like two to three webinars a week. We had an enrollment and marketing one. There was an early education one. I think that might be even concluding right now. Um, and so we've, there's been a couple of them coming up per week. That's a great way to find other people. You know, much like this, there's questions. And actually, what's what's really great about those webinars is they actually have chat rooms that people go into. Um, towards the second half of it. So they're usually about, I think, I think about an hour and a half long because there's the content and then the panelists and then they move into the chat room. So that's a great way to do that. Um, if your school is a member school, you'll have access to ACSI Community, which is actually an online platform. You can also go to the website there, um, speak with your administrator and uh, be able to access that as well. So there's a lot of great tips and tricks and things being shared, uh, shared there. So. Um, I've been really pleased with how the whole sector has has just sort of stu stood up in a very non-competitive way and just said, and you know, you guys are a huge part of that also, and just said, hey, we this is a this is a moment of of crisis, a moment of opportunity. How are we going to serve schools and educators that we know and love if, during this time? And so I've been like really, really pleased with that, even for those of us who are caring for Christian schools and caring for Christian school leaders to see that even amongst ourselves, it's a time of learning and a time of coming together and collaborating. So I think that's exciting as well. Absolutely. And so I put here in the chat, um, the ACSI's website, you can also go to schoolcovid19.com where we have a link to the ACSI um, uh, COVID-19 page there where we're trying to use that as a hub to just put as many resources as we can. And um, we're so thankful for all that your team is doing. I'm, oh my goodness, working tirelessly to get all of this content up to help folks lead through this crisis as well as possible. Um, and then I also put the link to the podcast episode that Brian and Lynn did uh, a few, I guess it was a couple months ago, um, but we just released it uh, this week so that you all could hear that as you are learning from Lynn today. So that link is also there in the chat box. I also put the allbelong.org that you mentioned, Lynn. So lots of resources there for everybody. Um, we are so thankful for you, Lynn. I'd love to pray for you before we um, end our time together today. I want to remind everybody that um, our team is available to help you in any way that we can during this time. And um, let me get back to my, oh, come on. Well, I was hoping I would be able to show you my email address. There we go. That's that's my email address there. Uh, you can also give us a call. Email me and I would love to set up a time. There's no sales pitch, promise. Our whole team is just dedicated to praying with you and supporting you, whether you're, we have a lot of organizations that are unfortunately having to go through layoffs or staff reorganization. And that is what we specialize in here at Vander Woman. And so Brian would love to just visit with you and hear what you're going through and um, offer any wisdom that we have to help you through this time as you care for your staff and your team and your families um, through COVID-19. So you can email me to do that. Well, I'll pray us out, Lynn. And um, we just thank you everybody for being a part of this webinar today. Dear Father, we come before you. We just thank you so much for Lynn and her her ministry through her career in education, Lord, and just the wisdom um, that you have instilled in her to inspire all of us, but especially those in Christian education, to just think about what could be, Lord, how we can impact future generations for Christ through the amazing institutions um, that are a part of ACSI and the broader Christian education community. So we thank you for Lynn's leadership as she is an innovator herself and a researcher and can inspire those around her and her sphere of influence all over the world to just think creatively and innovatively as we strive to be excellent and reach the next generations with um, with your truth and and then ultimately reach the world with your gospel, God. And so we just pray blessings upon Lynn and her family. Um, Lord, we just pray for health for her family. We, um, we just pray that you would bring them close together during this time. We pray for the ACSI team uh, that's spread out across the country. We pray for all of the ACSI schools that are across the globe. We thank you for the, the sphere of influence that ACSI has. Um, in your kingdom around the world. And we just pray blessings upon them, Lord. 
and all this in your name we pray amen, amen. thanks again thanks Lynn so thanks for absolutely. all you guys are doing it's been great thank you absolutely and we'll put this up on schoolcovid19.com once we have the replay link ready thank you so much everybody